So everybody take a pause. Let's turn our cell phones off. Oh, a little bit of a hum. We'll work on that. Let's turn our cell phones off. And, and the handout that you've been given, you don't even need to look at. It's better if you just sort of focus up here and listen. Um, but it is a good summation of what I'm going to be talking about. So that sort of frees you up to just pay attention. And we're going to talk about unity and diversity in early Christianity today. Um, in actually, we're going to take a look at what happened to Christianity in the third and fourth generations, uh, mostly in the 200s and 300s of Christianity, um, which is a very interesting story. But before we begin with that story, if we're going to talk about that story, we really need to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Greek and Hebrew words behind spirit also mean what? What else does that pneuma? Breath and wind. Right, breath and wind. Wind is about movement. Wind is about movement and woo and change. For example, wind is often announces to us that there's a change in the weather, doesn't it? It is wind that sweeps over the face of the deep and dark waters and the formless earth as a prelude for, for, for God speaking creation into being. Is that not true? Wind was there at the beginning. And in Genesis 2, the Lord God breathes into Adam the breath of life. The Holy Spirit in the Bible is always, almost, almost, almost always about creativity. It functions in that way. So the Holy Spirit was there at the beginning of creation. The Holy Spirit took possession of Israel's prophets. They were possessed, to say the least. The Holy Spirit put fire in John the Baptist's bosom. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary at the conception of Jesus. And as a dove, the Holy Spirit lights on Jesus at his baptism as a way of inaugurating his ministry. And then Jesus promises the Holy Spirit at the end of his ministry in John as the comforter or the paraclete. And the risen Jesus in John, I don't know if you know this, but the risen Jesus in John also breathes the Spirit on his disciples at the end of the gospel. It's a very important component and of course, on the day of Pentecost, wind and fire from heaven invades the entire house of believers to inaugurate the ministry of the church. The believers were the Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, the Mesopotamians, the Judeans, the Cappadocians, the Cretan Arabs, I love this list, and visitors from Pont Pont Pontus and Cy Cyrene and Rome. And it says there were 3,000 people added on that day. So clearly, the Holy Spirit is doing something really special and creative. And in this case, it's uh, creating and bringing into being the church, uh, which would soon open its doors to all. So it's all about initiating and inaugurating. Down through the ages, the Holy Spirit has been doing that, revealing, liberating, transforming, initiating and inaugurating, inspiring, radicalizing, and calling us, hasn't it? It's always been there. And I love what uh, the Franciscan uh, friar Richard Rohr said about the Holy Spirit. He said, it's a true homing device, a homing device that God has implanted it in us to move us forward. Remember, it's about movement, that sense of movement and revolutionary change that's attached to the idea of Holy Spirit comes out in Mrs. Eddy's definition of wind in science and health. She says, that which indicates the might of omnipotence and the movements, plural, of God's spiritual government encompassing all things like the air we breathe. So the Holy Spirit is all about creating startups <laughs> and infusing it with spiritual capital to keep it going, right? The Holy Spirit's breath of fresh air gives life. It is in the business of making living organisms, <laughs> okay? But what happens in the third and fourth generations of these startups um, that take what the Holy Spirit instituted 
and institutionalizes it. What happens if the unsettling and unpredictable presence of the Holy Spirit is reduced to a mere trickle? And this is what we're going to talk about today. Bible scholar Eugene Boring notes that the church finds itself with a double task. One is to bear witness to the once and all revelation given to the world in the there and then event of Jesus of Nazareth, okay? But also the second task is mediating the continuing voice of the living Lord. And in those first 150 years of Christianity, okay, the risen Christ as the continuing voice of the risen Lord was very much alive and present among the members or the faithful. I don't know about membership at that time so much. Earliest Christianity was a blaze of vision-filled healing and revelatory glory. Everybody was doing it. Earliest Christians did not define themselves by doctrine. They defined themselves by what they were experiencing. It's that simple. And you see that in the book of Acts with Peter and Stephen and Philip and Aeneas and Paul all experiencing revelatory movements. In fact, Paul had a complete makeover, didn't he? And speaking and acting boldly. Paul's letters are full of the word charisma. Do you know what that means? Uh, well, that's, that's, that's charismatic, it sounds like that. But it actually comes from the Greek word um, charis, which means grace. And it's associated with the spirit. And Paul uses that word charisma in some form or another throughout his writings. He's very interested in that direct charismatic. You know, you've heard of charismatic movements in Christianity. Those are ones that are spirit-filled and that have leaders that are spirit-filled. You could almost say that, uh, that Christian science was a charismatic movement thinking about Mary Baker Eddy. In those early days, in the first through third centuries, so you're talking about the first 200 years, maybe even 300 years, yes, there was no church order, there was no settled doctrine or traditions at all. There was no authority who would decree that the Holy Spirit was no longer needed or that this or that revelation was not true because the bishop said so <laughs> and had all the answers. None, none of this confining was going on at that time. So what resulted because of that is this broad stream of writings and visions and movements as Christians put to papyrus their visions, their experience, uh, and created uh, these churches and these communities like the Montanists. There's many of them and all the Gnostic groups uh, based on these experiences and visions. So it's a real free-for-all. <laughs> um, also, what is affecting the shaping of early Christianity um, is the conversation that the church was having with the Greco-Roman world as they adjusted and adapted to this world. And I think that this is probably the major influence on shaping Christianity, for good and for not so good. And let's start with Paul in the beginning with his vision on the road to Damascus. He's adjusting, we'll see. After being accosted by Christ at that time, he has this vision. He immediately goes to Jerusalem to receive the tradition from Peter, right? But then what does he do with that tradition? He interprets it. And he interprets it in a way that will be offensive to some of the Jewish Christians, in the Jewish uh, Jesus followers in Jerusalem and ran counter to the Jerusalem apostles. But this is what he gives and hands over to his Gentile churches. So from the very beginning, we have this, this uh, broader stream that's broadening. And the stream gets even broader when we look at our Gospels. Paul was in the 50s and early 60s. Mark is 70. Matthew and Luke is 80. John is in the 90s. And that stream just gets broader and broader because 
the gospel writers took their traditions and the oral, oral and written traditions that they received and interpreted it in a compelling way that spoke to their own constituency, their own community. So as uh, I think Jamie said yesterday, even in our New Testament canon, written you know, about 50 years after Jesus or more, does not provide a foundation for the church of unity <laughs> in that way, but rather of a multiplicity uh, in the church, a multiplicity of the church, the basis of it. Then with the third generation, that stream became a river and overflowed its, its banks altogether. With more and more writings in circulation, and everyone was borrowing from everyone else. If you read the writings of the church fathers, they're quoting from here this writing and that writing, and Clement's quoting from Irenaeus, and Irenaeus is quoting from Origen, and Origen's all over the place, and he does a major exegesis of the Bible with his own interpretations. And often these writings, they don't say this writing is from, they don't have footnotes <laughs> or bibliographies. They don't even have titles. They don't even say this is from origin. They just borrow freely. Um, I kind of like science and health. <laughs> you wish that Mrs. Eddy had nailed down some of the places where she was talk, borrowing some of her material. Um, and there was that sense of freedom, that almost the spirit-driven writing, that, that um, uh, a free hand kind of way of doing it. So, and this, this early kind of liberty to interpret, to experience the spirit, um, to adjust to the, the, the very fast-paced world that they lived in reminds me very much of the Christianity of today as people feel free to once again um, begin to explore what it means to be a Christian and to live their Christianity. Going back to adjusting to the Greek and Roman world, the biggest influence on early Christian formation was Greek philosophy. Did you know that? There was a huge freedom at this time as these uh, writers conversed with Greek philosophy. And we see this most clearly in the church's growing focus on doctrine and theology. This is a focus about knowledge, about gnosis, and that's a key Greek concept of knowledge. The church's prioritizing of knowledge differed, differed fundamentally from the Jewish worldview of primitive Christianity, which was all about apocalypse and history. Paul in 1 Corinthians in the first chapter describes that the Jews require what? The Jews uh, are demand what? No? Signs, meaning events, history. Whereas the Greeks desire what? Wisdom, knowledge, gnosis. The Holy Spirit became the spirit of truth, or the spirit of wisdom. And God's revelation became no longer God's self-communication in events, which is what you get in the Bible, but as communication of truths, the church began to discuss the nature of the Trinity. What is the being of God? What is, the, what is the divinity of Christ all about? Is Jesus God? The presence and nature of Jesus in the Eucharist. All of that became about knowledge. This is a major shift, okay? Christian history scholar David Bosch makes a comparison between the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gives us and the uh, Nicene Creed in 325. What do you think is, can you just even think about what the difference is there? And the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus. It's an illustration, a beautiful illustration of the switch from experiential Christianity to knowledge Christianity. Because the Sermon on the Mount is all about ethical expectations and conduct, isn't it? And there's no metaphysical speculation in there at all. The Nicene Creed is all about doctrine and metaphysical speculation and says absolutely nothing about how a Christian is to behave or the conduct of the, Christ of the Christian. This switch from history and, and, and uh, experience to knowledge produced three centuries 
300 years of theological wranglings. Is Jesus God or not? The whole, the whole thing. And it was pretty tense. And this switch also produced then set doctrines where the church became the bulwark of, of correct theology, of orthodoxy, of doctrine, as well as the disciplinarian of those who didn't toe the line. That was the effect of this switch to knowledge. And I think it's so interesting today um, with the failure of the Enlightenment with its focus on rationality and, and confidence and knowledge to solve humanity's problems. And we say, well, you know, that didn't quite work for us. That now in the Christian church, there is this uh, craving, this starving among Christians for a more hands-on, experiential, um, spiritual, uh, mystical practice of their faith and that that, their experience is becoming the basis of authority instead of a doctrine or, or knowledge. This is a major switch that's going on today. And you see this, you know, this, this craving for spiritual experience. You see it in the Pentecostals, in the New Age, in the uh, emergent churches. And I think the Christian Science Church fits right in there with our experiential, spiritual emphasis as well. You know, it's no coincidence. Um, I kind of disagree with Jamie that there hasn't been a, a decline in the mainstream churches. Uh, in fact, she then turned around and said that the, her, the main people in the seminary now are the non-denominational people. And I thought, well, <laughs> um, but there's, it's that with the decline of the mainstream churches, the Pentecostal church um, has just exploded with its personal experience of the spirit just exploded it, on a global scale. In 1970, there were 63 million Pentecostals. Today, there are 631 million Pentecostals, about a fourth of all Christians. But back to the fourth century. The churches unifying around creed and doctrine came with a price. This is when religious identity became synonymous with conformity to a certain set of beliefs, and grace, charis, charisma, became um, a, a, a confined to ritual. And this is an oversimplification, but this is the general drift of things. And any prophet's proclamation of a revelation became very sus suspect and heretical, and finally shut down by the Catholic Church's belief that Jesus' teachings were finished, signed, sealed, and delivered, and given over to the apostles, who then handed it over to the bishops. And what's that called? Do you know what that's called in the Catholic Church? Apostolic succession. This is the whole basis of the priesthood. Jesus, apostles, priests, and bishops. The Bible scholar James Dunn observes, and I think this is a very interesting observation. He says, um, perhaps the tragedy of early Catholicism was its failure to realize that the biggest heresy of all is the insistence that there is only one orthodoxy. Dunn also points, points out the irony that in bottling up this charisma, this charis, this spontaneity of the spirit into office and tradition, when we do that, that vital Christian experience is then pushed out beyond the mainstream Christianity. It gets pushed out of that, that mainstream is a good word, where it then lacks the checks and balances that are needed for the spiritual enthusiasts that uh, Irenaeus calls them. So you have everyone doing and believing um, and it, outside the mainstream, as the Spirit calls them, but losing the Holy Spirit's creative tension with tradition. There's another pressure point that greatly shaped Christianity. Are you still with me? Okay. Um, earliest Christianity. And going back to uh, uh, Church Father Irenaeus, who is really kind of the father of orthodoxy, Orthodoxy really didn't come about until the 300s, but, it, but he sort of started the, ro the role 
Um, and he was lamenting the church divided by these spiritual enthusiasts, and he, but he was also lamenting the church divided and, and crushed by persecution. His own church was almost completely wiped out by uh, persecution. And it was a combination of the diversity with the uh, uh, persecution that he felt could actually um, destroy the church altogether. He was really concerned about it. And this was, he was in the mid 100s. So the very survival of the church at that, it was rather tenuous. This persecution became acute in the third century, particularly in the reigns of emperors Decius and Diocletian, or Diocletian. I think he was 250 and 300. And Diocletian inaugurated the Great Persecution. It's called the Great Persecution, um, which was an all-out assault on Christians. This is right before Constantine. All citizens of the empire were required to sacrifice to Romans' gods forcing Christians to make a choice between martyrdom and apostasy. You know what apostasy is? Anybody know what that word means? It means to be disloyal to your own tradition, um, renun renouncing your own faith. And they had to choose. It was very black and white. In these cycles of persecution, scholars are finding out more and more that not all Christians had the courage to be martyrs. In fact, vast numbers of them apostatized, mainly by cursing Christ or worshiping or sacrificing to Roman gods. After these cycles of persecution, many of those that had uh, apostatized themselves wanted to be reinstated back into the church and sought forgiveness. And this caused tremendous tension in the church, especially and particularly in the churches of North Africa. Many believed that apostasy was an unforgivable sin. And these were called the moral rigorists. You got those in your church? The moral rigorists? <laughs> Who felt the church would be made impure and unholy by readmitting these lapsed. Particularly troubling to the rigorists were reinstating the lapsed bishops because the bishops did all of these sacraments, didn't they? They, they, they um, convened all these or presided over these sacraments where people's very salvation was at stake, stake and people took that very literally. You know, this talk is about how a radical idea is compromised by inside and outside pressures. Well, the rigorous wanted to honor the martyrs in the church and to reinstate these lapsed would be dishonoring them. And they also wanted to honor Jesus' own radical example of sacrifice uh, on the cross uh, by the Roman state. So to give in and compromise themselves to the state was unconscionable to them uh, at a most fundamental level. Uh, compromising Jesus' rad own radical stance. However, there were other leaders of the church who wanted to reinstate these lapsed because for them the church's unity was at stake. And these were called the confessors because they devised a kind of a 12-step program of, uh, that would reinstate the lapsed that included and demanded of them confession, penance, and then reconciliation with the church. So there was a process they went through. They also turned to the example of Jesus with his open uh, table fellowship with sinners, his forgiveness of sin, his compassion for the weak. So you had Jesus and his example being used in both cases. The result is that um, the bishops in the rigorous camp and the bishops in the confessor camp split the church in two for 300 years in North Africa. There were these two churches. You can see how persecution, that outside pressure, had a profound impact on the church. I think somebody should do research on how persecution uh, made, might have shaped Mrs. Eddy and her theology. I think that would be a very interesting uh, study. The rigorous camp actually formed their own churches and became disaffected 
from the Roman Church. And for the sake of their salvation, Augustine, in the early 300s, or the, um, he would urge the Roman Church and its, its affiliation with the state, with its troopers, to come in and try to force the rigorous back into the Roman Church. He did not succeed. They remained and survived as a separate church for those three, three centuries. These were times of very, very deep questions for the Christians, profound in nature about the function of church. Is the church a society of saints whose holiness and moral purity set them apart from all others, which is really the very definition of fundamentalism? And if so, the standards must be maintained, particularly for the leaders, don't you think? As the, as the moral rigorous? Or is the church a society of sinners whose, whose only difference from the outside world is their devotion to Christ and who believe that God's grace is sufficient to reach the penitent ones, to reach these believers through the preaching of the gospel, through the sacraments, and through penance, even though their priests and bishops might not, might not be perfectly blameless? You see? So the shift goes into, and this affects actually the, um, the, the Eucharist tradition because the church switched the uh, power of the Eucharist into the bread and wine more and less on the, on the bishops and their, in terms of where the salvific, the saving value was. And so that, uh, that switched the, the morality of the priestly office. It lowered that level, and you can see the effect of that today. It's, it was the moral rigorous idea that the church should be pure and separate um, and uh, set apart from society. And, you know, one can see these same membership issues and perceptions or understandings of church in our own community today, can't we? Very much so. So the division of the church into two churches, the confessors, and the rigorous presented another disturbing question for the common believer, which was the true church. <laughs> or, or is there more that can there be more than one church? And this was really, really important because they had to be baptized into the right church or they wouldn't be saved. These are, you know, this was profoundly disturbing for them. Another question arose: who's supposed to be responsible for their unity? And the answer to this question was a major step towards the papacy because Augustine turned to the Roman church as the authority to settle this issue and that gave power over to the primacy of the bishop of Rome as the, uh, to settle this dispute. By the 300s, a church hierarchy was in place Bishops were wielding power, not only in disputes, but in battening down the hatches of canon and creed. A mainstream Orthodox Christianity began to emerge, an orthodoxy that sealed in a standardization of preaching, interpretation of scripture and, and tradition, and all kinds of church instruction. David Bosch, a Christian history scholar that I really, really appreciate, describes the differences between an institution and a movement. He says an institution is conservative, a movement is progressive. An institution is more or less passive, uh, yielding to influence from outside. A movement is active, influencing, rather than being influenced. An institution looks to the past, a movement looks and moves toward the future. An institution is anxious. A movement is prepared to take risks. An institution guards boundaries. Movement crosses those boundaries. In the year 313, Emperor Constantine established Christianity as the religion of the empire, the Holy Roman Empire. The church went from being outsiders to insiders, and quickly became all about maintaining order and preserving the social and economic status of the priests and the leaders. 
um, in you know the, the religious control and their religious privilege. The priestly class took over the church and they began to affiliate, they did actively affiliate with kings and emperors as their patrons. Constantine, for example, gave the bishops judicial authority in their districts and employed them as political aides, which meant that they may, were then responsible to the state for everything that they did. He asserted his right to appoint bishops and also to make theological judgments about what is orthodox and what is heresy. And he does both of these at the Council of Nicaea in 325, a council which he convened, not the bishops, and a council meant to unify Christianity and also to pacify it because they were astir with all kinds of theological debates. And he said, let's settle it all. I don't care what it is, <laughs> let's just come up with a a set doctrine, and that's it. After the council, he ordered all heretics and schismatics. Schismatics are people that are divisive in the church. I would probably be a schismatic. <laughs> and between the heretics and the schismatics, as defined by the Council of Nicaea, Elaine Pagel, a Christian history scholar, says that was half of all Christians at that time. Schismatics. Yes, yes, yep. Constantine ordered them to stop meeting even in their houses, and they were to surrender their churches and even their own personal property to the bishops who were faithful to the Nicene Creed. He's really battening down and unifying through force, really. Predictably, Christianity grew more militant and intolerant um, as it aligned with empire and power and money and war. Richard Rohr points out that the text written be in the, uh, the hundred years preceding 313, which is when Constantine took over, that it was unthinkable that a Christian would fight in the army because they were killing Christians, but that by 400, Christians were the army and they were killing pagans. The irony is that just as the Western Church began to call itself Catholic with a big C, capital C, they were becoming less Catholic with a small C, which means universal. The Church of Late Antiquity had forgotten their Bible story. <laughs> and I'm talking about the Hebrew Bible here to a certain extent. Remember Israel's decision a thousand years before Jesus they said, we want kings, and we want a kingdom like everybody else, starting with David and Solomon, and, and uh, Saul is in there too. And this was their first situation for Israel of the tension between church and state. But more important, it was a real theological crisis for them because the kings began to usurp Yahweh's place in the grand scheme of things. A thousand years later, Many of the Jewish people in the time of Jesus refuse to accept Jesus as the Messiah because he did not restore to them a state, the kingdom of Israel. And in fact, Jesus would completely redefine that word kingdom altogether. Yet 300 years after Jesus, with the emperors Constantine and also Theodosius the Great, uh, who followed, it would be hard to tell church and state apart once again. Um, the, well, Constantine is in the 300s and Theodosius the Great was also. I think there was one emperor in between them. David Bosch points out a very interesting side effect of this union uh, of Christianity with empire. Christianity in its infancy was this bold confession of Jesus as Lord in the face of the emperor cult that, that worshiped the emperor, right? Now, Christianity became a compromise where the emperor was to rule in time and Christianity was to only rule in eternity. One of the outcomes of this is surely dualism, where the separation of earth and heaven, where the church becomes an institution only about otherworldly salvation. And this whole idea of the Christ or Jesus being 
accessible to our earthly condition was um, lost to a certain extent. But the major loss of the union of empire with Christianity, and also as a result of the lockdown in the third and fourth centuries of canon and creed, um, was its heart, Christianity's heart. It is very well documented by scholars that Christ primitive Christianity in its earliest form grew exponentially, it just mushroomed. Why? Because of the gospel of love and charity, its care and involvement with the poor, the widows, the immigrants, the sinners, the sick, the prisoners, the slaves. That was so powerful. If you were a member in a brute Roman world, this would be balm to your heart to actually see genuine uh, Christian compassion the great heart of compassion, which reflects the nature of Christ. It was a thing of power and beauty at that time. However, with church and state united, this all changed. Richard Rohr describes, he said, as Moses, uh, the first prophet, learned, once Pharaoh is your benefactor and protector, you, there are many questions you just can't ask. You can't ask about liberation of slaves in Pharaoh's house when you're at the dinner table with him, right? Or talk about questions of justice and equality. But there were others at this time that were not dining with the emperor. <laughs> Especially there were the monastics of the third century. The, their very lifestyle, their very lifestyle rejected the materialistic and political aspects of the kingdom now called church. And by the end of antiquity, around 500, there were 100,000 monks living in the desert in Syria, in Egypt, in Palestine, and all the faithful were flocking to them, circumventing the bishops to, to, to come in contact with these holy men and women, mostly men, but some women. Monasticism played a major role in Eastern and Western Christianity in preserving that sense of genuineness about Christian faith. And their very active ministry to the poor was also significant. That's part of the genuineness, isn't it? And it's where the Holy Spirit was nourished and flourished. And you see that because of all the great mystics that came out of them, mostly out of the monasteries, and were supported by them. Now, I'd like to, to jump ahead a thousand years for just a moment because we like to think that Protestantism, when it arrived in 15, the 1500s, was a vast improvement on the Catholic Church's imperial ways. And it was, to a big extent. It gave them freedom once again to experience the Holy Spirit openly. They were able to interpret the Bible non-mediated by a priest they were able to translate the Bible into their own vernacular language and to be accountable to God alone, that direct experiential relationship with God. As Martin Luther so eloquently stated, here I stand, God help me, amen. The problem was that each of the Protestant groups that came after Luther stood somewhere else. <laughs> The Protestant Reformation very quickly became diversity on steroids. <laughs> and, it, and a really interesting example, right after Luther, during Luther's lifetime, there was a, a priest named Zwingli who started his own Reformation movement in the great city of Zurich, and Zwingli and Luther couldn't stand each other. Then came the Anabaptists, the Huguenots, the Unitarians, the Mennonites, the Amish, the Quakers, and of course the three Johns, John Calvin, John Wesley, and John Knox, and et cetera, et cetera. And these were inspired men and women and movements. Make no question about that. But in response to all this diversity, the followers of Luther decided that after his death that they felt the need to nail down what his beliefs were and consolidate his theology, and the, the effort took up 23 volumes, big, thick volumes, and was actually called schol uh, Protestant scholasticism. In other words, what Luther instituted 
his followers institutionalized. David Nystrom, a Christian history scholar, would observe, he says, increasingly it appeared to Europeans that the intense theological disputes of this period concern matters of diminishing significance. And each tradition became both increasingly inflexible to deviation and apparently less responsive to the rhythm of the parish and the needs of the spiritual life. Nystrom's comments show how it might have been a confusing time for the lay person at this time who was used to one priest, one church, one theology, and you go there and you, they tell you who you are and what you believe. But more than that, the laity took it on the chin in another way and were deeply affected and compromised by what happened next. And this is when Europe's princes, and there were lots of them, and nobles and kings, sought to affiliate with either the Catholic Church or one of the different Protestant reform groups. And they did that because they were really sick and tired of paying taxes to Rome. And so I thought if they affiliated with the Lutherans or with the, the reformists or the Calvinists, that they would get away from, uh, they'd be at arm, more at arm's length to Rome, have more independence, and they wouldn't have to pay taxes. As different states made official their affiliation with whatever Protestant group was out there, or the Catholic Church, they then banned everybody else, which kicked out the people from the country. They were, uh, and their property was confiscated. And so began in the early 1600s what was called the Thirty Years' War in Central Europe. I didn't know this until I studied Christian history. A time of constantly shifting alliances and fierce religious rivalry. By 1648, that, that war, 30 years of it, they were mutually exhausted. And a final peace was hashed out called the Peace of Westphalia. But by that time, a third of Central Europe's population was gone from that war. A third. And Europe was a wasteland. And this is what's happening in the Middle East right now, isn't it? Remember Jesus' final prayer before his crucifixion in the Gospel of John that we've been talking about was that we be one as he and his Father were one. And why? So that the world may believe. Europe lost so many believers in the 1600s. In 1590, half of Europe was Protestant. In 1690, only a fifth of Europe was Protestant. Europeans came to equate um, orthodoxy, whether Protestant or Catholic, with hatred and bloodshed. And this Thirty Years' War is one of the main reasons why Europe is so secular today. They said, we don't want any part of this. Now, this is really an upbeat talk, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this history is important, I think, because we're not any different than what happened in early Christianity, in a way. With such a history of conflict and entrenched self-interest, have we learned anything at all? <laughs> have anything really changed? Well, 15 years ago, um, a professor of Christian history called Dr. Alan Callahan, uh, amazing person. He was a New Testament professor from Harvard Divinity at the time. Um, and it, he's an ordained Baptist minister. And he would take up this question in one of the talks he gave at the Foundation for Biblical Research, where I was a director. And I loved his answer. I'll share it with you. He explained that the record of revolutionary movements throughout history is very bad. Most of them don't succeed very often. He said, yet some social historians are saying that even our, our significant failures leaves a historical residue or residual. That is, a group of people will organize and, and work to create change and put forth what he calls a historical project and work in history to make those, change those conditions in some way and they fail, um, even though they've tried very hard. And I'm thinking of Egypt and the revolution there at the moment. Yet the historical process, he said, is never the same after that. Something has changed. Because these people have set 
into the historical stream a paradigm shift that is a force to be reckoned with, and subsequent generations pick up that paradigm shift and they carry it forward and it becomes even a worse threat to the existing dominant uh, status quo. And this is what he said Jesus accomplished. In his own moment, wherever he went, he did damage to the status quo, didn't he? His gospel, the gospel story is clear that even though he was challenged at his every step, he came away with his huge crowds and entourage of followers, having been profoundly affected by him. He said, no matter what happened to that man, Jesus, his project, God's project, has been initiated and it cannot be rolled back. And I re that rem reminded me of being in South Africa during the time of apartheid when the South Africans were kicking that dust off their feet. And I was there for almost 10 years, about nine and a half years. And it was during the whole transition to majority rule. And I didn't see that majority rule until the end, but you could see the change taking place. And everybody knew when the time had come when they couldn't go back. As powerful and militaristic and forceful as South Africa was to maintain control, it was powerless to stop this juggernaut of paradigm shift, of transformation taking place under its very nose. It could only just watch. It was thrilling to watch. And this is what's happening on a grander scale with the Jesus movement. Even the hostility of the world, which you see in Jesus' death on the cross, couldn't stop what he started. In fact, the crucifixion of Jesus in some ways made things only worse because now all his followers are going around and saying he's not dead. <laughs> the ruling elite in Jerusalem would continue to be troubled by these faithful Galileans who were clearly not with the program of Roman domination. They were operating on a different frequency, the Holy Spirit. It is clear that Jesus did an extraordinary amount of damage in a very short period of time, and the more the enemies tried to do damage to control, the worse it got. To conclude, needless to say, we need in our church less company men or women, <laughs> and more prophets and monks and revolutionaries infused with the Holy Spirit. We simply cannot understand Jesus from positions of power um, and control and privilege. We just can't do that. Remember, it was the power of the insiders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the priests, in cahoots with Rome that crucified him. The ongoing movement that began with Jesus' life continues to this day to be a force to be reckoned with. But this sense of movement can't happen with us without tapping in to the continual frequency, the different frequency of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. And I love this passage, this, this statement from Christer Stendhal, who was a Harvard Divinity professor of, a while back. He said, flashlight, battery, voltage, Christianity. is certainly not strong enough to fight the drug habit. And no religious tradition can renew itself without the infusion of raw and fresh primary religious experience. It's kind of what I'm looking for when I talk about my own relationship with God. That raw, I love that word raw and fresh primary religious experience. Paul tells, that, tells us that creation is waiting with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. We must break the pot in which for centuries, yea, millennia, ancient and not so ancient, models of theology, autonomy, sexism, separation, intolerance, fundamentalism, and sterile dichotomies have existed like a stunted bonsai. And you know what? We're doing it. 
Just look at the Supreme Court while we've been here in the last three decisions they've made. Absolutely stunning. We are doing it. The plan is not to repot what doesn't work anymore. Buckminster Fuller said, never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing models obsolete. I love that. May we be open to the unsettling yet joyful presence of the Holy Spirit, always at work in our midst, to inspire and inaugurate and help carry through with us this vision of the Spirit. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Thanks. <laughs>